History of England, Chapter 9, Part 7. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Chapter 9, Part 7. James wavered. He wished to be surrounded by troops on whom he could rely, but he dreaded the explosion of national feeling which the appearance of the great Irish force on English ground must produce. At last, as usually happens when a weak man tries to avoid opposite inconveniences, he took a course which united them all. He brought over Irishmen, not indeed enough to hold down the single city of London, or the single county of York, but more than enough to excite the alarm and rage of the whole kingdom, from Northumberland to Cornwall. Battalion after battalion, raised and trained by Tyrconnell, landed on the western coast, and moved towards the capital, and Irish recruits were imported in considerable numbers to fill up vacancies in the English regiments. Of the many errors which James committed, none was more fatal than this. Already he had alienated the hearts of his people by violating their laws, confiscating their estates, and persecuting their religion. Of those who had once been most zealous for monarchy, he had already made many rebels in heart. Yet he might still, with some chance of success, have appealed to the patriotic spirit of his subjects against an invader, for they were a race insular in temper as well as in geographical position. Their national antipathies were indeed, in that age, unreasonably and unamiably strong. Never had the English been accustomed to the control of interference of any stranger. The appearance of a foreign army on their soil might impel them to rally, even round a king whom they had no reason to love. William might perhaps have been unable to overcome this difficulty, but James removed it. Not even the arrival of a brigade of Lewis's musketeers would have excited such resentment and shame as our ancestors felt when they saw armed columns of papists just arrived from Dublin, moving in military pomp along the high roads. No man of English blood then regarded the aboriginal Irish as his countrymen. They did not belong to our branch of the great human family. They were distinguished from us by more than one moral and intellectual peculiarity which the difference of situation and of education, great as that difference was, did not seem altogether to explain. They had an aspect of their own, a mother tongue of their own. When they talked English, their pronunciation was ludicrous, their phraseology was grotesque, as is always the phraseology of those who think in one language and express their thoughts in another. They were therefore foreigners, and of all foreigners they were the most hated and despised, the most hated, for they had, during five centuries, always been our enemies, the most despised, for they were our vanquished, enslaved, and despoiled enemies. The Englishman compared with pride his own fields with the desolate bogs whence the Rapparees issued forth to rob and murder, and his own dwelling with the hovels where the peasants and the hogs of the Shannon wallowed in filth together. He was a member of a society far inferior indeed in wealth and civilization, to the society in which we live, but still one of the wealthiest and most highly civilized societies that the world had then seen. The Irish were almost as rude as the savages of Labrador. He was a free man. The Irish were the hereditary serfs of his race. He worshipped God after a pure and rational fashion. The Irish were sunk in idolatry and superstition. He knew that great numbers of Irish had repeatedly fled before a small English force, and that the whole Irish population had been held down by a small English colony. And he very complacently inferred that he was naturally a being of a higher order than the Irishman, for it is thus that a dominant race always explains its ascendancy and excuses its tyranny, that in vivacity, humor, and eloquence the Irish stand high among the nations of the world, is now universally acknowledged. 
that, when well disciplined, they are excellent soldiers, has been proved on a hundred fields of battle. Yet it is certain that, a century and a half ago, they were generally despised in our island as both a stupid and a cowardly people. And these were the men who were to hold England down by main force, while her civil and ecclesiastical constitution was destroyed. The blood of the whole nation boiled at the thought. To be conquered by Frenchmen or by Spaniards would have seemed comparatively a tolerable fate. With Frenchmen and Spaniards we had been accustomed to treat on equal terms. We had sometimes envied their prosperity, sometimes dreaded their power, sometimes congratulated ourselves on their friendship. In spite of our unsocial pride, we admitted that they were great nations, and that they could boast of men eminent in the arts of war and peace. But to be subjugated by an inferior caste was a degradation beyond all other degradation. The English felt as the white inhabitants of Charleston and New Orleans would feel if those towns were occupied by negro garrisons. The real facts would have been sufficient to excite uneasiness and indignation. But the real facts were lost amidst a crowd of wild rumors which flew without ceasing from coffee house to coffee house and from ale bench to ale bench and became more wonderful and terrible at every stage of the progress. The number of the Irish troops who had landed on our shores might justly excite serious apprehensions as to the king's ulterior designs, but it was magnified tenfold by the public apprehensions. It may well be supposed that the rude kern of Connaught, placed with arms in his hands among a foreign people whom he hated, and by whom he was hated in turn, was guilty of some excesses. These excesses were exaggerated by report and, in addition to the outrages which the stranger had really committed, all the offences of his English comrades were set down to his account. From every corner of the kingdom a cry arose against the foreign barbarians who forced themselves into private houses, seized horses and wagons, extorted money, and insulted women. These men, it was said, were the sons of those who, forty-seven years before, had massacred Protestants by tens of thousands. The history of the rebellion of 1641, a history which, even when soberly related, might well move pity and horror, and which had been frightfully distorted by national and religious antipathies, was now the favorite topic of conversation. Hideous stories of houses burned with all the inmates, of women and children butchered, of near relations compelled by torture to be the murderers of each other, of corpses outraged and mutilated, were told and heard with full belief and intense interest. Then it was added that the dastardly savages, who had by surprise committed all these cruelties on an unsuspecting and defenceless colony, had, as soon as Oliver came among them, on his great mission of vengeance, flung down their arms in panic terror, and had sunk, without trying the chances of a single pitched field, into that slavery which was their fit portion." Many signs indicated that another great spoliation and slaughter of the Saxon settlers was meditated by the Lord Lieutenant. Already thousands of Protestant colonists, flying from the injustice and insolence of Tyrconnell, had raised the indignation of the mother country by describing all that they had suffered, and all that they had, with too much reason, feared. How much the public mind had been excited by the complaints of these fugitives, had recently been shown in a manner not to be mistaken. Tyrconnell had transmitted for the royal approbation the heads of a bill repealing the law by which half the soil of Ireland was held, and he had sent to Westminster, as his agents, two of his Roman Catholic countrymen, who had lately been raised to high judicial office. Nugent, Chief Justice of the Irish Court of King's Bench, a personification of all the vices and weaknesses which the English then imagined to be characteristic of the Popish Celt, and Rice, a baron of the Irish exchequer, who, in abilities and attainments, was perhaps the foremost man of his race and religion. The object of the mission was well known, and the two judges could not venture to show themselves in the streets. If ever they were recognized, the rabble shouted, "'Room for the Irish ambassadors!' and their coach was escorted with mock solemnity by a train of ushers and harbingers 
bearing sticks with potatoes stuck on the points. So strong and general, indeed, was at that time the aversion of the English to the Irish, that the most distinguished Roman Catholics partook of it. Pallas and Bellasis expressed in coarse and acrimonious language, even at the council board, their antipathy to the aliens. Among English Protestants that antipathy was still stronger, and perhaps it was strongest in the army. Neither officers nor soldiers were disposed to bear patiently the preference shown by their master to a foreign and subject race. The Duke of Berwick, who was colonel of the 8th Regiment of the Line, then quartered at Portsmouth, gave orders that thirty men just arrived from Ireland should be enlisted. The English soldiers declared that they would not serve with these intruders. John Beaumont, the lieutenant-colonel, in his own name, and in the name of five of the captains, protested to the Duke's face against this insult to the English army and nation. "'We raised the regiment,' he said, at our own charges to defend His Majesty's crown in a time of danger. We had then no difficulty in procuring hundreds of English recruits. We can easily keep every company up to its full complement, without admitting Irishmen. We therefore do not think it consistent with our honour to have these strangers forced on us. And we beg that we may either be permitted to command men of our own nation, or to lay down our commissions. Berwick sent to Windsor for directions. The king, greatly exasperated, instantly dispatched a troop of horse to Portsmouth, with orders to bring the six refractory officers before him. A council of war sat on them. They refused to make any submission, and they were sentenced to be cashiered, the highest punishment which a court-martial was then competent to inflict. The whole nation applauded the disgraced officers, and the prevailing sentiment was stimulated by an unfounded rumour that, while under arrest, they had been treated with cruelty. Public feeling did not then manifest itself by those signs with which we are familiar, by large meetings and by vehement harangues. Nevertheless, it found a vent. Thomas Wharton, who, in the last Parliament, had represented Buckinghamshire, and who was already conspicuous both as a libertine and as a Whig, had written in a satirical ballad on the administration of Tyrconnell. In this little poem an Irishman congratulates a brother Irishman, in a barbarous jargon, on the approaching triumph of popery and of the Milesian race. The Protestant heir will be excluded. The Protestant officers will be broken. The great charter and the praetors who appeal to it will be hanged in one rope. The good Talbot will shower commissions on his countrymen, and will cut the throats of the English. These verses, which were in no respect above the ordinary standard of street poetry, had for burden some gibberish, which was said to have been used as a watchword by the insurgents of Ulster in 1641. The verses and the tune caught the fancy of the nation. From one end of England to the other, all classes were constantly singing this idle rhyme. It was especially the delight of the English army. More than seventy years after the Revolution, a great writer delineated, with exquisite skill, a veteran who had fought at the Boyne and at Namur. One of the characteristics of the good old soldier is his trick of whistling Lillibulero. Wharton afterwards boasted that he had sung a king out of three kingdoms, but in truth the success of Lillibulero was the effect, and not the cause, of that excited state of public feeling which produced the revolution. End of Part 7